My name is Professor Fiona Devine. I'm head here of Alliance Manchester Business School, which is part of the University of Manchester. And it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's event. So that welcome also extends to all of you in the room, but all of you who I know are also joining us this evening online. So welcome to both audiences, which we very much hope to integrate and, uh, and facilitate engagement um, fully in tonight's lecture. So tonight I am delighted that we are joined by AMBS alumnus, Sean Marrett, who is Chief Business and Commercial Officer at German biotechnology company, Biontech. Sean will talk about how to build a business for innovation. Given the hugely significant global role that Biontech played in developing the first ever approved mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccine in partnership with Pfizer, I cannot think of a more fitting case study in terms of how to build a business for innovation. Indeed, as we mark nearly three years since the start of the COVID-19 global pandemic, Sean will provide us with a fascinating insight into huge opportunities and challenges which, were, which we all faced by what became, of course, what, uh, the company became one of the leading global players in the fight against the virus. Its vaccine was given to more than a billion people in over 160 countries during the first full year on the market. And that is an incredible statistic. Sean John joined Biontech in 2012. And prior to that, he worked in global strategic and regional marketing and sales roles in GlaxoSmithKline in the United States and Pfizer in Europe. He held business development executive roles in Evotech and Lurantis the latter of which he helped to successfully sell to Celdex Therapeutics Incorporated. During his career, Sean has successfully completed a number of complex licensing transactions with large pharmaceutical companies, as well as negotiated a variety of mergers and acquisitions transactions and raised finance from investors. <clears throat> Sean holds a BSc in biochemistry from King's College London, but most importantly, an MBA from <laughs> Alliance Manchester Business School, of course, at the time, Manchester Business School. Indeed, he has previously told us that his experience at the business school was crucial in his de decision to pursue an international career. A year ago, Sean was recognized in the New Year's Honours List, becoming a companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George for his services to the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. Although BioNTech is best known for its amazing work with the COVID vaccine, it announced in January this year that it will now be starting cancer vaccine trials in the UK from September with the NHS, which is very exciting news. And indeed, earlier in the month, month of January, it agreed to buy an artificial intelligence startup in Strict Deep, as it seeks to harness machine learning to improve the drug discovery process, including developing personalized treatments tailored to a patient's cancer. So this is a company without doubt that is at the forefront of these sorts of developments. Now, the discussion tonight is going to be facilitated by my colleague, Sylvia Massini, who is a professor of economics and the management of innovation here at AMBS. Sylvia's research interests include the emergence, adaption, adoption and diffusion of digital technologies and their impact on innovation processes and strategies. And she's also in, interested in the relationship with skill needs and changes, industry and university collaborations, and the sourcing of innovation and other business services. There's going to be plenty of time for questions towards the end of the, today's sessions. 
Uh, and those of you in the room will can raise your hand in the traditional method, but those of you online, do please chat your uh, type your questions into the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And as I say, what we'll do is, is move between two types of questions in the, in the Q&A session. So without further ado, can I now hand over to Sean? Thank you very much, Sean. Oh, thank you very much, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be back. Actually, it's uh, it's a different uh, uh, a different business school uh, structurally than I remember it, and, and much posher. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello. I'd start. Um, if you want to build an innovation company, you have to have a motivation for doing it, and uh, this is our motivation uh, right from the beginning. Uh, this uh, picture shows a late stage cancer patient. And the one thing you notice is uh, how thin the arm is in this picture. And the reason for that is because uh, the cancer is growing so quickly in this patient that uh, it's getting the body to break down muscle to feed it so it can grow even quicker. Late stage cancer is a very, very difficult uh, thing to treat. Uh, it's still, uh, despite all the modern medicine, it still uh, has high mortality over a five year certain period. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the immune system, which can distinguish between good and bad, and cancer's bad, to destroy cancer cells and cancer in this jewel between the immune system that protects you and in fact your immune systems remove damaged cells every day the jewel between the immune system uh, and cancer can tip and then the cancer can establish itself all we're trying to do is re uh bring equilibrium to the balance again and get the immune system to destroy these cancer cells. It's very emotive for us. I spend time on this because uh, it's hard to do this. I, I really can tell you it's you have the ups and downs of a, of, of a small company, but this is what motivates us. Um, and it, it, it has done from the beginning. And it says here, there's no drug, I'm afraid, available for your cancer. But we're going to make one just for you. And we believe that's the future of cancer therapy. And that is the heart of our company from the beginning. I talked to, I, I'm not really going to go through the st statistics on this, but it is a big burden globally. Uh, and you can see this here. Uh, on this slide, which really talks about 18 million cancer cases in 2020, and it's growing. We do believe very much, and we, we talked about our artificial in, uh, AI uh, acquisition. AI is going to help us become more precise uh, because the immune system, and that's what we do, we develop immune drugs is very precise and so artificial intelligence will help us design those drugs in a better way but simply and this is probably uh, uh, the, the most instructive slide that we as a company use um, if you look at cancer molecularly what you see is of course, mutations. You sit on it, you go into, the, everyone knows this, you go into the sun, UV radiation destroys, damages your skin and the DNA. And that leads to mutations. And over a lifetime, they all, they all sum up and then you get, uh, then you get cancer. What, what we do is we take these mutations in one of our programs, uh, and, and generate an immune response against them because these mutations, of course, 
are non-self, they're not expressed on normal tissues. And this means that you can develop a very specific therapy with the side effects that you wouldn't see with chemotherapy or radiotherapy to really treat cancer. This is the basis for our company. And our vision as it re remains today is to really use the immune system uh, to improve the health of people worldwide. Uh, it's a fascination for the immune system that, that, as I said, really, really drives us, and in particular in cancer. I mentioned it wasn't, uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, and um, we were fortunate in that um, we received um, funding from family office, which is unusual actually uh, for our business is normally venture funding uh, to support us uh, for a number of years. And we just built our company and the technologies around it. BioNTech, by the way, stands for bio and the NT, which is in capitals, stands for new technologies. All of what we do is with new technologies. Uh, the reason for that is because existing technologies, we believe, may have reached a plateau in the ability to treat disease. Um, instructive here is um, we spent the first uh, five years of our, our company in stealth mode, just building the technology. So we didn't even have a website. And it's very interesting, when I first started talking to pharmaceutical companies about licensing uh, or collaborating with us, I remember one said, You're, you, you can't be a biotechnology company, you don't have a website. <laughs> but we did at that point have 300 scientific publications uh, including a number in nature, which in our business is, 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 a, is a big marker of validation. But nonetheless, that was the position. Uh, and, and the company evolved. Um, we generated uh, cash through collaborations. We internationalized our um, investor base. Uh, and we went public. And uh, the public, when we went public, we went in, uh, on the NASDAQ. The reason for that was because uh, in the US for our business, uh, that is where most of the capital sits. Uh, the US has uh, an, a different attitude to risk capital in our view than our home base in Europe. I'm sorry to say that that is the case, but us Europeans are more risk averse. And to build a company like this, we had to go uh, to the US. So uh, it was a personal uh, it was a personal goal of mine, actually, since since business school. I remember when we pressed the bell on the NASDAQ, and I said, oh, God, I finally reached my aim. Uh, and I told my colleagues about this, because I was, this is a real, a special project for me personally and I thought I'd have a rest and then COVID came and that changed our company forever um, I shan't talk about this but I shall go on to COVID uh, because um, mm, we uh, developed uh, a non-validated technology in 11 months from the start of the project to a full approval of a vaccine. To put that in perspective, the normal approval time and research and development cycle for such a vaccine would have been 12 to 14 years. Um, we did it in 11 months and we did it um, through um, really 
working a lot in parallel uh, in order to achieve uh, that um, that timetable. We set about the timetable in January 2020 of having a vaccine by the end of the year. And we, we did it. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, the current statistics uh, are, I think we've vaccinated about uh, a quarter of the world population have had our vaccine. So about 2 billion people globally, uh, because you have to have more than one shot. We've actually shipped 4.4 billion doses. And uh, we, uh, our vaccine's been used in more than 118 countries. At the beginning, we had, when I think back to our board meeting where we decided to put our company on one project and turn it from cancer to COVID. We had no idea how to scale up manufacturing. We had no idea if this was even going to work. We had no idea if anyone was going to buy it, if it worked. We had no supply agreements in place. We had no global distribution. We had to do all of that in 11 months. Unfortunately, because of the way that uh, pharmaceutical approvals work, we, um, uh, we received approval while we were still scaling up. This meant that those 180 countries all wanted at that precise moment, our vaccine. So we had to decide how to distribute that. And um, I remember that my wife, um, she, um, she actually got so fed up with the phone ringing that she, um, she threw me out and I had to take calls from governments in the car in the winter in Germany, and it's a cold place sometimes, I can tell you. <laughs> but these little stories I'm telling you, because this was part of the spirit and the excitement of really doing something novel. And that's what I love about innovation. It's novel by definition. And you're never quite sure which way it's going to go, but you have to believe in it. And we, from the beginning, had our belief in cancer, as I explained, because we didn't want patients like the one I showed at the beginning to get to that state. We were about 700 people uh, at the beginning of COVID. We're now four and a half thousand people. That in itself brings us challenges, of course. Um, we were uh kids i would say if i was to put it in a family term when we entered the covid development and 11 months later we were grown ups but we missed out on the teenage years and uh we're feeling the teenage year we're feeling that now because suddenly the way that we worked as a team with 700 people, which we could manage. Now we have four and a half thousand in a very short period of time. So that brings management challenges. Uh, but uh, fortunately, um, we, uh, we have some very good people in the company who help us uh, manage those challenges. The reason for showing you this slide is because we're in the United Kingdom. Uh, we did in January uh, uh, sign a, uh, actually it's a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, to um, bring or test our different technologies in cancer patients in the United Kingdom. Bring our technologies to cancer 
in the in the UK. Um, it's uh, quite a landmark deal because um, it means that uh, things, uh, the way we do this will be very different than giving chemotherapy. It requires looking precisely at the genome of the cancer and deciding what uh, pharmaceutical product that we're developing, we will test in that patient. Longer term, the UK will benefit from, of course, the results of that. The other thing to notice on this slide is uh, in 2020, we had, we just bought a company in the United States, but there was only one big bubble and that was in Germany. We're now internationalized uh, in the United States, Europe uh, and uh, Asia. Um, and we will continue to expand as we build uh, our global business. I think I'm going to show you another slide because that's boring. I'm going to show you something more colorful, and that's this one. I said that we use different technologies. What, 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 why, why do we do that? Um, it's because uh, you need a portfolio of technologies uh, to calibrate the treatment to a patient. And um, that's, that's really what we have. And probably before the pandemic, uh, everyone knew about cell therapies, protein therapeutics, small molecules. <laughs> Nowadays, everyone wants to talk about mRNA and what it can do. Um, it's important, if you can, to have a breadth of technologies so you can combine them. Because for us, anyway, treating some of these diseases won't be a single product. It'll be a combination of products to really uh, destroy that tumor. And you have to think about it like this, you know, ovarian cancer, ovarian cancer, unfortunately, is a disease that is um, diagnosed late, because they're not really very many symptoms. And when it's diagnosed, uh, sometimes the tumor is the size of a small orange. And just imagine, a small orange growing exponentially and you're trying to kill it and you're trying to kill it with immune cells you have to get the immune cells to grow at a faster rate than that tumor to destroy it or and or you have to attack that tumor from multiple angles hence the different technologies and I believe that um, over the next 10 to 15 years, we will see much more precise treatments, much more combinations of treatments, and much more success in, in our quest for, for treating, treating cancer. So I will... <laughs> Just stay on this one for one moment, just to say, uh, nowadays, I think in, in, in five to 10 years, I would say, not five, we expect uh, some of these novel therapies, about 30% could be based on mRNA itself, um, which, uh, which is exciting for us because it's a very uh, versatile technology. And what I learned from, from business school is uh, there's no question that um, when you're trying to figure out, and if I think about COVID, um, CapEx requirements for factories that you don't yet exist, or um, 
how you price a vaccine or how you estimate a cost of goods. Uh, or, as I said at the beginning, it, how, are you going to make money? How will you do that uh, to fund your research continuously? Continuously, Finance uh, plays an extraordinary role in that. For me, it really did. I, I uh, am very grateful to the school because um, it was really hard for me at the time. But I learned so much and I use it all the time in my job. And uh, I think um, one of the things that when I was at here, I spent six months in the US at the business school in the US. And I noticed uh, that uh, Americans have, as I mentioned, a different risk profile. And I learned that the seeds of that from, from my exchange uh, from this school. Uh, and one of the other things uh, I learned was um, quite a respect of different cultures. Um, with me, when I arrived, uh, I was um, a, a British person on a board where we had one German person and one Turkish person, uh, which was a very interesting dynamic. But despite these different cult cultures, we really work seamlessly together. And I believe that um, for me, it was a recognition that uh, actually everyone has something to say uh, for, and you just have to know how to bring that out of them. I learned that here because I remember uh, being in teams of five or six people from different nationalities. We were forced to work with people from different nationalities, which made us very uncomfortable. I was a lot younger then, uh, but that set the, set the foundation for our company today, which has um, some 80 nationalities working in the, com in the company. So I, I think I want to conclude there because uh, all of these help you build uh, an innovation company, but what really helps you? These are the these are the these are the foundations. But if any of you want to do it yourself, what you really need to do is believe in what you're doing, because if you don't have that, it won't work. And I'd like to leave you with that thought, because in the darkest moments for me, when when I went to New York to raise finance and people said, I've never heard of your company in the middle of winter when it was dark and raining in New York and I was going from one fund manager to the next. What kept me going was a belief that we will, through our company, be able to treat cancer patients in a different way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, good evening, uh, Silvia Massini. And um, well, fascinating uh, presentation and story that you told us. And uh, I have so many questions here. For, um, I'm supposed to facilitate the discussion, and I take the privilege of uh, the facilitator. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions, not so the 20 that I wrote down. So uh, you talked uh, about uh, the importance of uh, the, the MBA uh, studies that you've done uh, with us, but you have a strong uh, scientific background. Uh, and uh, even now, when you were talking about uh, how you could present uh, your company to potential funders, how important is it for a leader in a science-based company uh, to have this mix of uh, science and the business background? Yeah, I, I think it's essential. I, uh, uh, it's essential. And for us, we, uh, when I went fundraising uh, in the US, what you have is you have some very, very, very technical 
specialist investors and they invested in us. When I think about Fidelity, for example, uh, which everyone knows, I mean, they are hardcore scientists. So if you cannot talk their language, they won't invest in you. It's no good just to say, uh, oh, we, you know, we've got a vision and we've got, uh, uh, we've, you know, we've built this company to this point in time. They, they want to know about the science. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, if you can't speak that language, uh, it, it's very difficult to get funding for a company like ours. Yeah, you need to speak both languages. Yeah, yeah you do. Yeah. Um, then, uh, so what I have learned is that actually uh, BioNTech was developing a cancer yeah. uh, treatment uh, and then uh, the pandemic uh, uh, arrived. And uh, how has your business model changed uh, probably two or three times uh, because previously you were just a research focused uh, company you were not uh, or maybe you were already a uh, manufacturing drugs then with a, a vaccine uh, you have developed uh, a very very uh, timely and successful uh, vaccine and uh, you had a certain stream of revenues then and uh, uh, how is it going to change now, both in terms of uh, uh, the business model, the revenue stream that is coming, probably governments are stopping uh, buying vaccines. So it will become a, a private uh, product, not uh, bought by the NHS. So what are the implications for, uh, implications for your business model? And, uh, and then uh, how is that going to help uh, developing cancer again, cancer treatments again? Yeah, so I, I think that, um, I mean, uh, you know, we did take a risk by it, it, in January of 2020 by putting the company on COVID vaccine. Uh, we just raised finance. Uh, but what it allows us to do now is we don't have to keep going back and asking, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as it was then, a loss-making company, burning cash for more cash from the financial markets. Um, because in a business like ours, um, uh, you never get enough money. You've always got to go back and you've always got to prove yourself that you've done something with the previous amount of money. We don't have to worry about that anymore. So I think that's, that's the first thing that changes in our business model. None of us have to go finance, uh, uh, raising finance. I think the second thing is... Um, uh, I spent uh, a, a lot of time uh, from May 2020 negotiating supply agreements with governments, as you said. Um, and um, I mean, the, the governments ordered, they paid us, we delivered. Uh, this, the market now will change to what, what I grew up on, which is uh, regular pharmaceutical market, which I would describe, which means that uh, we will um, have to convince uh, physicians and payers as to uh, why they should use our vaccine compared to someone else's. I think we've got an advantage. I mean, a quarter of the world population has had our vaccine, but nonetheless, it's you know, you cannot ever, ever, and this is what I've really also learned, never underestimate the competition, ever. If you do, it can be fatal, and we don't. Uh, we built um, in Germany uh, a sales and marketing group for our home market in Germany. Uh, that's had many advantages, but it's, it's there to help us uh, when other competitors come. One final question before I open to the other participants here. Um, so looking forward, the cancer treatment, and uh, you described uh, how uh, your technology works. And uh, uh, it made me think about uh, uh, what used to be mass customization in manufacturing, because what you are uh, talking about is that the treatment is going to be highly personalized. So how are you going to go how are you going to scale up uh, uh, something that is so personalized? Are you going to use new technologies to, use, to develop this new technology? 
AI, for example. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think, you know, you know the concept of personalized medicine uh, in its broadest term simply means uh, I have my tumor. And whereas in the old days, uh, you know, it came from a lung, so it's lung cancer. Uh, nowadays, it's this is the molecular signature, and therefore, what treatment should I use? And in some cases, you may have an individualized immunotherapy, or you may have something that you have uh, that you have on the shelf. And we do both. As I said, we have all of these technologies to allow us to do that, so that we can combine and mix dependent on the signature of the tumor. With respect to your specific question on you know, single batch manufacturing, in pharmaceuticals, we, we, we of course have to always demonstrate that we, what we produce is actually what it says on the label because you're treating disease. And not only that, but that you consistently and every time produce the same to the same quality. So in pharmaceuticals, you know, our whole system has been built around um, millions of tablets in one batch, which is economic to produce, and statistically sampling uh, the batch and saying what's in my statistical samples in the batch. So using statistical analysis to do that. You can't do that if you produce 200 uh, vials of uh, individualized vaccine for a single patient. It doesn't. You can't do it. So therefore, you need to do different things. And you're quite right. One of the things is uh, artificial intelligence, just becoming algorithmically very, very clever at being precise about how to define that individualized product. And the second thing is, um, is of course, uh, parallel automation. Uh, we, we, we've been manufacturing for 10 years. Um, we started it early because we recognize that uh, this is uh, quite a change to the way we do things. And um, it will take quite a while to uh, develop those technologies in manufacturing. Um, we've taken a leap. We, 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 we've, we've been to BMW and Audi Mercedes in Germany. It's one of the great things about being in Germany. We're in a manufacturing country uh, to learn from them because they just do an amazing just in time manufacturing of, of cars. Uh, in 2015, we um, hooked up with Siemens, uh, who was providing the software to do just in time manufacturing to those car uh, companies. Uh, and they adapted it for us. And it's that, uh, you know, if you, I mean, you probably didn't talk about Porter anymore, but if you look at the competitive advantages of nations, we're in the nation where you can really learn about manufacturing. And we need that for what we want to do in our manufacturing. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to take a few questions from uh, the floor. Um, can I kindly ask you to say your name and your affiliation before you ask your question so uh, Sean can understand where you come from? Yes, Panos. Thank you. Um, I'm Panos Konstantinidis. I'm a professor of digital innovation here at AMDS. So you mentioned that in January 2020, you were faced with the challenge of scaling up. Right, and, and it's, it's a challenge that a lot of startups face and many choose to sell out because of the scale of operations that they cannot manage, right? And I assume that you were in that position having to meet demand, global demand in the billions, right? So can you say a little bit more about how you were able to scale operations and you know, meet the demand and how you resisted <laughs> the the uh, the urge to potentially be um, uh, bought by a larger multinational or even merge with them. So I, I think on the on the latter, which is uh, uh, resist game uh, selling yourself to a pharmaceutical company, uh, we never wanted to do that. Uh, 
I said at the beginning, you have to have belief. When you have belief in your in, in what you're doing, the last thing you want to do is sell. I mean, entrepreneurs will tell you that uh, that um, they you know they they're so fixated on on getting to the end that it, it just doesn't come into into one's mind. And we set ourselves in uh, when I arrived, we set ourselves some strategic goals, and we said we want to build a global business. And we've never ever deviated from that. We've had to partner with people, and our partnering collaborations are 50, always 50, almost always 50 50 profit sharing because of our aim. Um, now, in terms of your question about scale and scaling, uh, we had the advantage that uh, we were already manufacturing at a small scale mRNA therapeutics for cancer treatment. So we had knowledge. What we didn't have is, is just brute force globally. And that's where we went to Pfizer, uh, who, uh, who originally said, ah, this is, this is COVID, things not going to work. But they, we did convince them. And um, I think that that strategic move um, did allow us to scale up. But together with Pfizer, when we got approval, we really didn't have very much vaccine to distribute. And um, we were in we were in this, we took so we in terms of scale up, of course, we had process developers from our company in particular, but together with Pfizer's uh, ability to manufacture at scale already because they're already producing vaccines. And so the combination allowed us to to scale up. But scale up to a point we took up we took risk in manuf because the process wasn't ready until the autumn of 2020. In the autumn of 2020, we started to um, manufacture at risk our, our batches. We didn't even know if they were going to be approved, the, the product. But because of the pandemic, we felt that that was the appropriate thing to do. But nonetheless, because of that short period of time between approval and the time in which we our scale was ready for manufacturing, we still couldn't produce enough vaccine. Uh, our... Our solution was um, in that summer of 2020, I went and bought a factory from a pharmaceutical company, Novartis. We, we did it in five weeks. Normally that takes nine months. Um, and we, we started to turn it into uh, mRNA uh, manufacturing. It manufactured a billion doses in that factory last year. Um, the way we did that was uh, we we needed approval of it. We needed to encourage regulators to come and because they have to come and audit you and say, yes, you're manufacturing good quality stuff. We're going to give you your certificate of approval. Uh, we said, if you do that quickly, we can give you more doses quickly. And for governments, they said, gee, that's a great idea. <laughs> And so we were able to do what some things you probably couldn't do in the ordinary course of business to help with the supply. Thank you. Was there a question here? Mm -hmm. Here and then. Um, hi, Sean. My name is Vidal. I'm studying for my MBA in the business school, so I can directly uh, relate to what you mentioned about those three things on your slide. <laughs> um, um, my question is uh, around cell and gene therapy. So you mentioned the role of cell and gene therapy in therapy areas like oncology. So at present, CGT drugs are very expensive and some can go into the millions uh, of dollars and governments usually don't cover the cost of treatment. Um, and it's, it's an ongoing conversation, um, but to a large extent, they don't. Uh, so how do you kind of make these drugs affordable to people who really need them, especially in the context of access to medicine, which has started after COVID? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I mean, again, you know, cell therapy is an individualized approach because obviously you can't give cells to anyone else because you'll kill them through an immune response. 
Um, I, I, I think um, I think if you look at the uh, manufacturing innovations, um, there are a couple of models that we see. One of them is um, uh, which the large manufacturers of equipment are very interested in is is um, doing the manufacturing in an enclosed system in the hospital. Uh, and so <laughs> you completely reduce the turnaround time, but also, I mean, some of these units, which we we were prototyping for a particular company in 2000 and, uh, 2013, uh, uh, you, they're enclosed, so you can you could you could have a room with manufacturing units about this size doing cell therapy. So I think that's one way you get 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 the get the cost of goods down. The other way is you know you're you're touching on a well how do you price a medicine uh, that has a high cost of goods? And I think the um, I think this is a um, this and this is a very emotive subject, but um, in in your question, um, there are various models that you can you can look at uh, whether it's a performance based model where you you get paid on outcomes. So if the drug works you get paid more. If it doesn't, you get paid less. Uh, or there's the regular uh, payment, which you described earlier. Um, both models uh, 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 are active today. Um, I think as we get, uh, as, we, as we treat disease earlier, because you know, in, in the next 10 years, we will go for blood tests and we will be told I believe that uh, from our blood tests, they will tell us we have some circulating cancer DNA. So this is before the tumors responded, uh, but, but, but before it's formed. Uh, and you treat at that point. How do you price that? What is the value of cure? This is a, this is a discussion not for here, it's a discussion that I don't think anyone knows the answer for, but we have to address it because the types of treatments we'll be doing will go exactly into that. You've got a blood test. It's no longer, I've got a death sentence, which a lot of people still, I remember the US ambassador when he came to us and he had leukemia and he was a survivor of leukemia. This was in Trump's... Uh, uh, one of Trump's ambassadors, and he he said to me, the first thing he said to me was, I thought I was going to die. I got diagnosed, and um, I looked at Dr. Google, and after reading that, I thought, I'm finished. Uh, the, 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 um, the point for me is that, I mean, how do you, how do you price those cures? Uh, and I think that's something that um, is a societal question that we're all going to have to address and in the early phase, as I said. Yeah. Thank you. Question? Uh, hi, uh, Ed Borland. I'm here on the AMAC. Um, my question is, what challenges did you face in working with the UK government and civil service as a client, and how did you overcome them? Um, well, with the Vaccine Task Force, uh, I remember taking my Pfizer colleague to meet the head of the Vaccine Task Force, uh, and she said to me, the negotiation over a supply agreement was like drinking a cup of coffee at Tesco's between two people. I found it uh, quite, uh, quite um, productive, but that's because uh, that particular person uh, came from industry. 
The civil servants that I dealt with in uh, more recently, um, you know, you have to consider that um, the apparatus of civil servants is such that they are following a life career and they don't want to take risk to upset that. So the way to motivate them and the way, indeed the way to motivate a government is to talk about, um, first of all, cancer, just as I have done with you on quite a personal level, uh, but of course, cancer on a societal level for the country. The UK has the worst cancer survival rates in the industrialized world. Uh, and that needs to change. And I think that's a huge motivation for the civil servants that uh, I deal with. Um, so I, I think it comes back to, uh, in this particular field, uh, what we are trying to achieve, which is really um, to um, improve patients' lives. And, the, you know, everyone says improve patient lives, but a lot of these people have been touched by cancer, so they know exactly uh, what I'm talking about. And that motivates them. Thank you. We can take a few questions from uh, people online, uh, and then uh, we, can, we will uh, continue here. Jim. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks, Sylvia. We have lots of questions online. Um, I'll just take a couple that perhaps uh, fit best with the conversation we've had. So one person's asking, you know, Pfizer and BioNTech were, were critical partners for the vaccine delivery, but actually very different kinds of companies. Um, what kinds of learnings for the future cancer treatments uh, and scale up can you take from the collaboration you had with Pfizer during, during the COVID-19 crisis? Um, I think um, uh, it, uh, um, what we learned from Pfizer is um, partly pharmaceutical development because we were forced uh, to confront regulatory questions about our pharmaceutical. Um, and I think um, Pfizer has a is a has an incredibly well oiled machine in this area. In in I don't know you probably don't know this, but um, in in Europe, the United Kingdom, and the United States, Biontech is the what's called the marketing authorization holder. It's Biontech's product. This means that, um, from a regulatory point of view, we had to learn our stuff to support all of the regulatory questions that uh, uh, the MHRA here or the EMA in Europe asked us we asked Pfizer actually to represent us with the FDA because Pfizer being an American company we felt that that was more appropriate but it did it did really teach us that and I um I think that we're a very very different company now with respect to scale up uh, uh I uh I think having seen uh Pfizer's factories it became uh, it became very clear early on that we needed to do the same and 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 build our own global manufacturing and um, and that's when we bought our our facility in 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 Marburg, which um, I was telling some people when uh, and we had a visit from our chancellor last week to come and come and talk about innovation and Germany. So I think that's what that's what I think uh, we learned. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one of one was um, in, in the finance round talking about how the role that um, IP the role that intellectual property assets play in the funding round. Um uh, if you're going to take a lot of risk and you've got to remember that uh, the statistics are such that 
if you have a, a, a product just starting to be tested in humans, there's a one in 10 chance of it making it to a product on the market. Uh, if you get to the market, you have to make sure that no one else can copy it for a period of time so you can get your investment back and, uh, and make some profit to allow you to reinvest in R&D. Uh, so uh, I think um, I think uh, for me, uh, IP is an absolute critical component of an innovation business. In software, the challenge is, and of course we have an AI company now. Some of the things you you think about, if you write them in a pattern, everyone else can see what exactly what yeah, you have. You know, so it, it, it's not always patents. It may be know-how that you choose not to patent. And we have examples of that in our company where we actively haven't patented. It's a trade secret. But uh, know-how, whether that's in a patent or if that's not in a patent, is a critical component of any innovation business, in my view. Yeah, thank you. Um, more questions from... Hi, um, um, from an entrepreneurial point of view, um, funding is a permanent need. I'm going a bit uh, at the beginning um, at your entrepreneurship with BioNTech. Um, I'm an entrepreneur myself and um, I have this need. How you raise money um, in a based way at the early stages of, of a project? You have the, when you turn into the vision into business, you have a proof concept how you raise money from, from there. Thank you. I mean, for us, it, it, it was, um, um, it was the um, ability, and we were fortunate in this respect uh, because we had a family office behind us. It was an ability to quietly develop our platforms, our technology platforms. Um, uh, once we developed them, then we validated them with pharmaceutical collaborations, and that helped. It didn't help completely because uh, I, when I did the um, uh, our first uh, funding, so which is series, it's called Series A funding, um, I could not find one investor, one professional investor in Europe to invest. Not one. Uh, and in fact, uh, I remember being at um, a conference where all of the, and these were all uh, European VCs, and they all got together and someone said, oh, they're talking about you. Uh, because um, the amount that I wanted to raise was so out of kilter with their expectations that they thought I was completely and utterly mad and they thought I'd never achieve it uh, and it was disappointing for me actually because as a European or as a, as a British person I would have loved to have European investors other than our uh, family office in, in in our series A but we couldn't find any so I went to the US and that's you know that's as soon as you'd sign the, as soon as we'd sign the um, Series A, I was actually quite despondent because I knew that we'd have to start again the following month for our Series B. And similarly with our IPO, as soon as we'd done our IPO, uh, I knew that we would have to do further financing. And that's, that's of course, um, the challenge for a company, an innovation company that's loss making, as we were then. So it, I, I, it is challenging. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But if you've got a validated uh, platform, and that's what we spent our early years doing, as I said, and we published on that, and those publications was, were really quite important, uh, that, that provided um, uh, validation for investors. And in addition to that, uh, we had... Um, we had pharmaceutical companies that paid quite big bucks actually to partner with us uh, as a validation too and that all helped. More question from the 
Hello, uh, my name is Patricia Gestoso. I'm the director of scientific services for Biovia, that is a, a life science software company. My question is, what is the role for um, and your experience uh, regarding philanthropy, dri driving and influencing this kind of research? Philanthropy, do you mean? Philanthropy, like, for example, there is a lot of invest, investment, for example, from, Bill, you know, uh, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates. Yes. And choosing and dry, uh, specifying, I think they are maybe the most notorious, but in the States, they can really shift, let's say, perspectives about res what research is worth pursuing. Uh, yeah, Bill and Melinda Gates are a partner of ours, uh, so uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, they, uh, uh, it is, um, it, 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 uh, they do do a very very strong due diligence uh, on the company before they invest. Um, I welcome it. Um, their interest is in, um, of course, providing medicines for. Uh, the developing world uh, and and that's something that we we do um, uh, we have a number of projects um, focused on malaria and TB I mean malaria is not it's not yet with global warming anything that industrialized nations worry about uh, but it is still a very big deal in um, parts of Africa and Asia and South America and um, uh, they will invest in those type of programs. Uh, and uh, I think it's quite useful to have that kind of funding because it allows you to justify the development of those programs with the full knowledge that perhaps they're not as going to be as profitable as a regular pharmaceutical product for the Western world. Uh, is there a question there? Yeah, and then we, we take a few more questions from the Online. Yeah, good evening, Sean. Uh, Owen Hughes, I'm on the AMAC. Uh, you mentioned you grew the business very, very quickly in a very short time and also globally. Are you able to share the lessons learned during that period and how is that how we, how is that uh how are you how is that affecting the business today? Um I would say that um as I said, you know, for us um If we were to follow a normal life cycle, we would have had incremental growth. When you get hyper growth, um, what you need to do is you need to put in structures very carefully, uh, very quickly. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure you do organizational design stuff as I learned at business school. And, you, you know, these uh, f fluid networks in a small company that drive a company no longer function when you've got four and a half thousand people working in that company uh, and so um i think that um i think that um the challenge for us or for me anyway personally is to move from something that uh, i i i been working with as a model for 10 years to a more structured approach. And I understand the structured approaches um, because uh, I've worked in uh, very large companies. Um, it's funny that um, after um, 20 years of moving away from a very large pharmaceutical company and working and then going back to it as a partner working with the marketing group, global marketing groups of Pfizer. I felt like I'd never left Pfizer because I started my career with Pfizer. It was remarkable that the processes, which are so very well optimized, um, are uh, run. And we are trying to take that. But the challenge for us is to keep that, that entrepreneurial approach. And that's hard to do. And it's taking us, um, it's taking a lot of management time to figure out how we do that. Was your connection with Pfizer uh, in, instrumental for this, the collaboration for the vaccine or uh, has it helped? Or no, no, yeah, I, so I did, um, when we were, again, 
I'm running out of money. I, I did a deal with Pfizer in 2018 to you know, to get 100 million back on the balance sheet, and um, that's how we got to know Pfizer in the infectious disease space. It was a flu vaccine, and I remember we sat we sat around and said, "Oh, you know, do we want really want to market a vaccine?" No, we're never going to produce millions of doses of vaccine ever. I remember that discussion, and then Something three, happened. yeah, three years later, we did exactly that. But that's the beauty of uh, of a young company. You you can just rip up the book and start again, and that's that's the the joy of working in these companies, at least for me. Very good. And a couple of questions. Yeah, this is perhaps one more. The, um, it's very similar to the first question, actually, that Panos asked tonight around scaling up, really. It's the person's asking, what challenges, if any, are you facing as you scale your company while maintaining levels of innovation? I think that, that was the question. Yeah, so, I mean, we've got, uh, I, I, you know, I alluded to this. We, we, we use certain organisational structures um, uh, to continue to uh, drive innovation in R&D. In manufacturing, uh, you know, and I include scale up and uh, 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 of manufacturing or automation in R and D because that's what it is. When you get to a process that you manufacture product with, it's 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 fairly uh, it's fairly inflexible process. Because you have to, because you you can't vary because without permission from the regulators, because there's a risk to human health, uh, and um, I think that that there's two bits to the company. There's the innovative engine, which we still run as innovation, and then there's the regulatory and manufacturing groups and the commercial groups, where we're very very bound by what we are allowed to say. Um, to physicians, all of this is is much more structured and, and regulated. And um, I think that um, our our challenge is to structure structures and non structured innovation. Uh, or it's kind of hard sometimes to get them to meet. And that's the challenge that we face. But um, we uh, we've we've been working on this now for eighteen months, and you know I can see light at the end of the tunnel, for, at least for our company. Good. Yep. One question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so how, oh, sorry. Do you want to start first, or? Yes. Excuse me. Yeah. There's sure. That, that, yes. Yes. Uh, evening, I'm Paul Riley. Uh, I used to work within companies, pharma companies, for 20 years, and, and I advised them as a, a consultant. Um, just thinking about the, the public perspective and seeing the, the rapid development of, of vaccines during the, the COVID era, uh, what, can the public expect more vaccines to be developed as quickly as we saw during COVID, or is that um, unrealistic? And I really want to know about the organizational learning that, that occurred within BioNTech and whether that's uh, Something that you've been able to harness, or is that just something that the MHRA has been able to speed approvals of that kind of thing? No, I, 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 I think it's not only us. Actually, I think um, the pharmaceutical industry have learned that you can do things quickly. I mean, don't, you know, when we talk about quickly, I mean, you know, if you think about COVID, we did in, in July to October, beginning of October, we, we, we tested the vaccine in 43,000 people, you, you can do this quickly. There is no reason why you can't. It's just, it's just because, you know, that's what we do as a pharmaceutical business. That's what we got used to. And I think um, companies see that too. Uh, our partner Pfizer sees that, you know, we see a, a speed that uh, in these companies now that, um, that, um, that has increased for sure. And I think that's a learning of the COVID. Even regulators and governments say, 
why can't we do it this as ordinary course? The fact that they're asking questions is a is a opening in itself uh, and, a, and an opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm Ernestina, currently teaching at the U Law and MMU in different subjects, pretty much. And um, funny enough, I do own a company in the U.S. in California in digital marketing. So I'm kind of curious about it's a very lighthearted question of what do you think is the most um, diff like the biggest difference between the U.S. market and how you approach the EU market or even to any other places that I saw on the map, like Taiwan or even other places? Yeah, so I mean, uh, when I was working in marketing in the U.S., we just had direct-to-consumer advertising approved by the uh, FDA, and so we could advertise things on TV, mm -hmm. which, of course, you can't do here. I think that um, the US and direct consumer advertising is a big difference. Um, I think that um, with artificial in, uh, machine learning, of course, you know, a lot of businesses now, the airline business uses machine learning, and, you know, uh, Amazon uses machine learning to give you your preferences. Uh, I think in in uh, the US and Europe, I think we'll see more of this for pharmaceutical marketing. However, uh, I think in Europe, uh, we're, uh, again, I'd say compared to the US, I think the US is more, more uh, open-minded on that compared to, to, to Europe. And that's something that uh, I think we need to work on because um, you do want to deliver the right message to the uh, right group of um, if if it's physicians, you might have physicians who are more interested in efficacy of the product, and whereas another group may be more interested in side effects. So I I see uh, it's actually you want to give them what they need, the information to make them a formed decision, and that that in Europe I think is more difficult than. It, it is in the US. And in Asia, yeah, Asia's, <laughs> I, I can't say too much about Asia from our partner in Asia, but um, they, the, 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 they do use, um, they do use machine learning. They do use machine learning. And it's in China, it's, um, it's okay to do that. Thank you. There were questions. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Maya. I am an economics student um, at the University of Manchester. Um, a few months back, I had the chance to speak with a transplant surgeon who specializes with innovation uh, in transplantology. And he mentioned that it's very difficult to implement innovation in a conservative um, medical field where uh, openness to implementing these sort of innovations such as, for example, uh, mRNA can be quite difficult. So um, I, I'm wondering what are the difficulties that, or are there any difficulties that you're facing as a company in implementing these sort of innovations uh, to a, a quite conserv conservative medical field uh, as oncology? Yeah, um, I, I think it's, um, it's always a challenge uh, to, uh, introduce innovations into the medical field. I mean, not, I'm not talking about incremental changes to a, a particular process. So if you're replacing a hip and you, you know, you use a slightly different material that allows the hip to, to last longer. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a sea change. Um, and uh, I think it is difficult because it's conservative because we're dealing with people's lives. Uh, having said that, um, uh, you, you, how do you address that? Um, you have to show you have to show scientific rationale, which is always data driven. Your surgeon is probably a scientist. He'll think like a scientist. The head of the MHRA thinks like a scientist here. The head of clinical programs for the NHS thinks like a scientist. 
Therefore, what you need to give them is scientific data. Now, that may not be sufficient because there's always the risk. And I think that this is where, uh, as a company, uh, I mentioned at the beginning how important belief is because you do go through these real ups and downs. Um, I think you, you, you just keep at it and it will change and it does change. Thank you, question here. Okay, here first and then. Thank you. Thank you for the inspiration, Nicole. Um, my name is Mercedes, I'm from the Toronto side. Um, you mentioned that you signed from around the founding with um, some um, Congress letters in the UK. I was wondering if, if, it, if you already have some um, collaboration maybe with the clinics in the UK. Or like when I was pretty hospital, one of the largest oncology clinics in Europe. So, so uh, yeah, so our, our memorandum of understanding is with the UK government. So one of the one of the challenges in in uh, clinical development is that um, generally speaking, and in the UK, if I look at the UK, we have all of these NHS trusts and they have all their own lawyers and uh, uh, and their own processes. And as a pharmaceutical or a biotech company, you have to, as you indicated, you have to go and contract with each of these centers. We don't want to do that. We want to do it a different way. We want one agreement. There is one NHS. There is one government. Our agreement is with the one government covering the NHS. With respect to uh, Northwest uh, uh, hospitals in the Northwest, um, I would really encourage uh, those hospitals who are interested to uh, talk to the government and get themselves included. We're completely open to it. We're actually testing, actually, um, in the UK at the moment, we've got um, actually on our individualized approach, which is that, you know, we take a tumor sample and look at the, as, uh, look at the uh, mutations and then make a product based on the mutation. We're actually doing a, 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 a colorectal trial in the UK, which is where we, when the surgeon takes the tumor out, uh, we immediately give our vac vaccine our therapeutic vaccine thereafter. So we're already in the UK, um, but we want to do this much, much more at scale. And um, a bit like my old university down south, you know, the Kings, I said, if they want to do something, you, just, you should just get in touch with the UK government. And they're very, very open to it. That's very interesting. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Afsal. I'm a graduate. Um, so there's a sense that machine learning uh, will be very useful in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but machine learning itself is also going through a lot of evolution. It's changing every three to six months. There are new models, new predictions, new tools, new ways of doing things. It's going through lots of change. So my question to you is, why buying a startup? when you could build partnerships with different startups or different research labs using AI or machine learning tools? Um, because it seems that your partnership with Pfizer worked out. So why not use that pattern again? Why buying a startup? Why not building a partnership with 10 startups and moving into the pharmaceutical uh, space? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. And um... I think the answer that lies for us when we bought in the company's uh, uh, InstaDeep in January, um, we'd, we'd been working with them for a number of years. And in fact, um, the, 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 their um, machine learning together with our biology uh, allowed us to predict uh, Omicron before it appeared. Uh, and a few weeks before it appeared, it was a very, very powerful validation of the science 
that convinced us that actually um, it's probably better to um, partner with this company in full because uh, uh, we'd already got a relationship with them. But the other model that you described is equally as valid. Partner with 10 and see which is the best. Uh, I think the only thing to say there is you have to have the bandwidth to manage 10 collaborations. And that's that's the that's the that's the, that's that can be challenging. Because if you do that not only in AI, but in various aspects of pharmaceutical development, very quickly you have quite a complex um, set of collaborations to manage. One question here. Hello, it's Peter Luke, uh, alumni of the Business School. Uh, Sean, you mentioned some of the funders thought you were a bit mad at times. Could, could you take us back to January when somebody turned into the office and said, hey, Sean, you heard about this COVID thing. Should we, uh, should we turn everything around we've been working on for eight years and decide to make a vaccine? Yeah, it, 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 you're right. It, it does seem a bit odd, but um, uh, I have a colleague um, who um, I'm fortunate enough to work with, who I believe has some uh, the most amazing insights into trends. He's an oncologist, um, he's a professor. Uh, when he was doing his oncology training, he got bored, so he did a maths degree at night. Uh, he has an incredible um, processing power. And I, when he said to us, um, and it was, a, I remember it, I mean, it was a Wednesday, it was, I think it was the 27th of January, it was a gray, I remember looking out the window, it was all gray, could have been Manchester. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he, he said, uh, this is going to be a problem for us all, but we can do something about it. Uh, I believed him. And I said, well, you know, we've just done an IPO on cancer. <laughs> so your point is absolutely correct. But I think that um, within, we started, we started the project on January the 27th. On April the 23rd, we had four, can, uh, four COVID vaccines in the clinic. I think that period of time was uh, sufficient for us to convince our investors that, you know, what we said yesterday was yesterday, but we, here's the validation of what we can really do. And um, uh, so I think uh, I think that helped keep investors, let's say, at bay. Um, uh, it was a risk, though. There was no question about it. We 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 turned the company. We we parallel processed everything just to put that three months or so in context normally it takes you four to five years to get to that point we did it in 90 days and not with just one we did it with four products uh, so you know i think that what we were demonstrating there to our investors was the power of mrna because you can produce it incredibly quickly so i'll give you an example of that in this time last year, the strain circulating was Omicron BA1. We, at the regulator's request, followed the traditional way of um, developing a vaccine very against this variant. We did a clinical trial in uh, a limited number of patients like you do in flu. We got the results in May. They were positive. The only problem was that in May 2022, 
there was no BA1 circulating anymore. It was BA45 between June and August, we reconfigured the vaccine to a BA45, which we brought to the market in September. Again, I'm, I'm saying this because um, in your original question, how did we manage our investors? And, and it, it really was demonstrating this power and we really put that into practice again last year. And I think that um, I can only say that um, had it gone wrong, it would have been hard for us. It would not have been terminal, but it would have been really tough. Um, I think um, for us now, I mean, when I look back on it, what I see is that every pharmaceutical company now is doing mRNA. So that's a real um, validation for, for us. But you're right. I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. That, it was always that at the back of your mind. Thank you. I think it's time to close and I pass it on to Fiona. So um, thank you very much, Sean, for all your, your insights. I mean, we've heard some incredible things today and I think everybody is fascinated by everything that you have shared with us in this incredible journey. And I know that we've had, we have many innovation scholars in the room and uh, I'm sure have been absolutely fascinated by the journey that you and your company have been on. Also like to thank Sylvia for facilitating uh, the Q&A session, but also thank you and also the online audience for, um, I'm sure Sean would agree with some really fascinating questions and, and the opportunity for, of course, for him to answer them. So we have ongoing series of events as, as we do in Alliance Manchester Business School. On the 27th of April, we have our annual Brigham McKennan Lecture that is named after the first director of the business school who had a very strong social conscience, which ties in with the University of Manchester, of course, social responsibility um, goal. So this year, we're going to be joined by Laura Spence, who's a professor of business ethics at Royal Holloway University of London and currently a visiting academic at Sa Saeed Business School. And she's going to be talking about taking SMEs seriously, social responsibility for the 99%. So I very much hope that you will join us then. But can I say that we offer Sean a round of applause? Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you.